haya kinyi Hai zukiswa, hai ndegwa. Hai. Why you greet me when I'm here? Um, just waiting for more people to join in. Hi Esther. <laughs> Hello. Where's Kola? Hi Kola. Oh god, hi Remy. <laughs> hi Unjaki, hi Le. No, Remy, it's too early for trolling, please. Um, so I'm just going to add I'm just going to add color. Yeah, waiting for call. Hi, Kola. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good to see you again. Uh, good to see you. Um, are you in the office? I'm in my house. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> same thing, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was just waiting for more people to join in. Sure. Um, so maybe, maybe as we wait for more people to join in, maybe you can just tell us a bit about you. Um, I mean, I have your bio, but, you know, it would be nice to hear it from you. Um, I am uh, a linguist. That's, uh, uh, that's the first thing I, 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 I claim with my chest. I'm a linguist and I'm a writer yeah. as well, occasionally. I mean, occasionally I write. Um, <laughs> so um, that's, I mean, that's all that needs to know. I, I'm currently a, a Shivney Research Fellow at the British Library. The last time we met, we were at the launch of the book by um, Maza. Maza, Maza, yes, yeah, I guess yeah. the, um, the Shadow King. Um, and I haven't seen you since then. Have you, are you still in London? No, I'm currently in Nairobi. Oh, you ran away as well? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> you fled. You know, everyone, had to, everyone had to run away, you know, that's not your home, <laughs> yes. so we try and yeah. run back home. Yeah. Yeah. So I left uh, if, when I when I, I was I was I was torn actually for a while whether to stay yeah. whether to leave, and then I heard that Nigeria was going to close the border. I was like, hmm, if the border is going to be closed, I don't think I want to be in uh, someone else's country and my family on <laughs> the other side. And so, so I just got yeah. in the plane. And, 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 <laughs> so um, yes, I write poetry. I um, do nonfiction. Um, yeah. Fiction. And I used to be a, I used to be a teacher of English. I, I've I've done a couple of things, but right now I focus on linguistics and, and creative writing. Okay. Um. So yeah, Kola is trying to be modest. So I'm just going to read out his bio because he's oh, trying no. to be like he's trying to be <laughs> like oh I haven't won all these awards out here. Um. Basically, the bio that I have of his is from the Miles Morland. <laughs> Remy, please come down. Um. The bio that I have from him is um, from the Miles Morland website, and it's it says Kola Tubosun is a Nigerian linguist, editor, travel writer, and scholar. All that his work has been published in African Writer, AK Review, Brittle Paper, International Literary Quarterly, Jalada, Popula, Saraba Magazine. I mean, we could go on. Um, in 2016, he became the first African, the first African. Yeah, the first African to be given the Premio Ostana, a prize given for work in indigenous language advocacy. Tubosun is the brain behind YorubaName.com, a crowdsourced multimedia dictionary of Yoruba names. He has been translated into Italian and Korean and currently works as a freelance lex lexicographer, you yeah? with <laughs> big names, big names, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with Oxford University Press UK. His collection of poetry, Edwardsville by Heart, was published in November 2016 by Wisdom Bottom Press UK. And remember, this was just when Kola had won the Miles Molland Prize for nonfiction, which is, I think, £27,000. So 
yes, it's not a I small think so. one like that. <laughs> so, Kola, let's start from there. You know, you yes. won all these. You've won all these amazing awards as a as a writer, as a poet. You know, you're you're working on a nonfiction book that talks about Wole Shoinka, and we read something that we presume is an excerpt on Popular a few a few a, a while ago. Let me say. So, yes. how does it feel to you know win these awards, and you know how do how do they shape your writing and stuff? Um. So in in twenty. 20- 2015, um, I stopped teaching um, English. I used to teach English language in high school. Yeah. Um, but during that time, I was I was an editor of a, a literary magazine called The Lit Mag. Um, I had been doing a couple of other writings, freelance writings and stuff. And when I stopped teaching, I was given a, I got a job at Google, so I was moving there. And I was telling yeah. myself that maybe finally my linguistic side is taking over and writing, you know, is gone. You know, writing has, has, has given me satisfaction, personal satisfaction, but there was no kind of any financial reward for, from it. Yeah. Um, but I was enjoying what I was doing when I was doing it. Um, and so I finished at Google. We did all the things we did. There. And I, I, I started researching a particular story about a house in Lagos Island uh, where Malaysia Inca's uncle used to live, uh, Professor yeah. Ransom Kuti. And I reached out to him to get his, his feedback on some of those uh, things. So that was when we started talking. Um, and there was a day I sent him a query about something and he said, oh, would you like to come to Abekuta? Okay, that was, I had gone to Ife. So his house had been turned into a, a museum and I'd gone there to see it. I wrote about it on my blog and I think he read it and sent me this angry letter that I had made a mistake and, and said something. I'd said that uh, I had heard which was true, that um, I'd heard that he, he had uh, wanted to be VC of the uh, University of Ife, yeah. um, which according to him was not true, that he never sought any uh, position. But I said that, that it was a rumor, right? So he yeah. thought, he said, no, 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 I never applied for it. I never wanted to be any you know, uh, public, uh, I never wanted to be any position in Ife. And he told me a couple of other things about his time in Ife and stuff. Yeah. So that was when I was started getting to talk. So then I, I saw this video about his house and I said, okay, um, tell me a little bit more about this, blah, blah, blah. And he said, would you like to come to Abel Kuta to see it yourself? And I was like, yeah. oh. So I went there and then, you know, the rest was the article you read. Yeah. So the article actually came before the Moland thing. Um, yeah. And I'd applied for Moland maybe two, three times before then. Um, and I'd given up, like, Maybe this my writing days are over. I'm just going to focus on my linguistics, and that was it. So when yeah. I had re- written the showing article, apparently it went really far. So many people everywhere send me comments about it. And I, the day I even applied for the Moreland thing, it was it was a deadline that I think passed. It was like a few minutes past midnight. I was just like, let me just write this bloody proposal about I'm going to interrogate your income more and stuff like that. And I hadn't yeah. expected anything was going to come out of it. So it did, and all of a sudden, you know, I, you know, maybe it was just writing, calling me back to say, you know. We're not done with you yet. So, so in in one case, on the one hand, it's it's very challenging. It's very interesting. It's rewarding. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's also humbling because you know that uh, you are given the prize uh, as uh, as an uh, as an expectation. You know that you yeah. do something great, and you want to be able to live up to that expectation. So, that's what I that's what I say. Mm. Well, that's a that's a really good trajectory because not many of us can boast of having sat down with a Nobel Nobel Prize winner and just you know spend time with them. So how how did that feel? You know, being in the presence of that greatness and just being able to talk to, <laughs> to him as if you're bra- as if you're bros just hanging out. You know. <laughs> well, for for um, you would know from I've interacted with people of that stature that. They have seen people um, really lose their minds on seeing them. They had seen people, you know, forget what they were going to say or, you know, scream or <laughs> faint. So you're, if, you, if you went that route, you're not going to get anything at all. Yeah. Um, so I think um, because I had seen him around many times, I'd been around him, I'd studied him um, for so long and I read almost everything he's written. Yeah. I had an idea of what, you know, what to ask and what he was. And I think the approach also helped him, um, helped him trust that I was not just there to, um, to just fund or to, you know, to, you know, farms, so to speak. 
I wasn't asking for himself. Yeah, it wasn't anything. I sent him an email, detailed email about what I wanted to ask, and it yeah. interested him, and he called me back to come. We were supposed to meet in Lagos, so on the day I went to Abuja, uh, the, the day, the Monday of the day, I went to Abuja on uh, Wednesday. Yeah. We we're supposed to meet in Lagos on on Monday in his office, and he sent me an email saying, "Oh, sorry, I can't make it." And there's something about him that I also found very interesting. For someone of his stature, he pays attention to anyone that he chose to give attention to. He's not. He doesn't say, "Oh, because I'm such a big man, I'm not going to respond to your email or stuff like that." He said yeah. in the morning, "Oh, we we're supposed to meet today." I think that uh, the rain has caused a lot of traffic on the highway and I'm not going to be able to come to Lagos. Yeah. So, would you like to come to Abekuta instead? Of course, it was a question, but to me, hearing, would you like to come to Abekuta, just everything in my head just went, well, he wants me to come to his house, I'm going to have to go there. And I started freaking out, of course, like, what am I going to do? Um, this is a once-in-a-lifetime once thing, I must, I must make a good use of it. I haven't yeah. planned to write anything about it. I still yeah. wanted to ask all the questions I wanted to ask. But I thought it would be nice to record it for posterity. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I didn't have any idea. Um, so I got a tape recorder. I took it along. Um, I also thought, let me get some pictures. Um, this time, I'm not going to be asking with my phone. I don't think it's that would look rude. I'm going to get someone along to just take pictures. Not Don't be intrusive. Just stay far away and take as many pictures as you can. Yeah. Um, he, I didn't even tell who I was going to meet. I just said, I want to have an interview with um, a And then we got the car and just drove. We were sitting in the room. He had gone out to see someone uh, out, and so we were sitting in the living room. And the guy, the photographer, had no idea who I was meeting. And you know, it was at the time when I asked him, "Do you know who we are? You know, who we are here to talk to?" It was at the same time he was looking at the wall and then discovering where he was. <laughs> he had been wondering before that what is this artwork all around? And then he saw the picture, and uh, as yeah. it was done on him, the professor was walking in from outside. So it was to him, it was you know such a shock. And then you know, I told him before, you know, don't get into the conversation, just stay as small as you can, as far away. So that was that. Um, I hadn't planned to do all of those things, but I what I knew was that I wanted to get his, his take on a number of things, yeah. Um, and I was surprised when after I walked in, he said, Uh, I want to show you around. So he got them to bring a jeep out. He hadn't met me. I mean, we hadn't spent that much time before. We had talked once or twice, but we hadn't spent this much time together. And he was open and free. And then he brought the Jeep out, and he just he drove me around. Um, and the photographer was there to capture all of this, so I asked all the questions. And one thing I said I was never going to leave without asking was his opinion on uh, B.S. Naipaul. Yeah. <laughs> um, Naipaul had just died, like, a couple of days before, so it was just perfect, uh, perfect, um, you know, uh, serendipity. And I said, yeah. with all the things that Paul had said, or people had said they had said about showing car, it would be nice to hear them on the record about it. So I was about to leave. He was about to go somewhere else. I said, you know, what do you think of <laughs> Naipaul? <laughs> and then he gave me this beautiful, beautiful line that I was like, ah, oh, this is I must write about this now. Now that he has talked about Naipaul, you know, everybody must know what he has said. Um, yeah. So that was that. So it's sometimes, you know what they say, um, success is a preparation meeting opportunity. Um, yeah. It was nice that I had read all the things I wanted to read about him before. Yeah. Um, it was nice that I didn't preempt the timing because, I mean, I've had opportunities to meet him different times, but it, the timing was just not right. It was just perfect at this time, and everything seemed to work out. So I can't <laughs> claim credit for it, um, but, I, you know, I think it was, it was a great that, you know, we talked about it. Okay, so one of the things I've, I've, I'm very interested in, you know, you obviously do very important linguistic work, but at the same time, you're a poet and you're a travel writer. So your poetry collection is, is, is it's a travel memoir, but it's also a poetry collection. Why did you decide to, do, to use poetry to capture your travel writing and not nonfiction? Yeah. Um, again, this is one of those things that I, I, wasn't, I didn't plan it ahead. Yeah. I knew when I left the U.S. in 2012 that I wanted to write about the three years I spent there. I didn't know um, what form the writing was going to take, yeah. but I knew I was going to write about it because I had so many memories and I said, I have to write about it someday. The conflicts came from me just trying to decide, do I want to write a self-help book of how to be a successful Fulbright, uh, Fulbright fellow? Because yeah. that was why I went there the first time, which would be just for people who are applying for the Fulbright program, what to do, what not to do, and all of that. Um, would it be um, my own nonfiction of America generally? Um, or would it just be, you know, I was just thinking of different, who is the audience of the things I want to write, and that would determine what I was going to write about. Um, so it took me many years. I left US in 2012, and the book I started writing in 2016 or 2017, I believe. 
So this was just the memory I've been there. I made sure that I, you know, I kept it in a good place. And so one day, my wife had traveled. Um, she had gone for an event for like six weeks. And I had the children all to myself. And when, I, when they went to school, I had all this free time. I left Google at the time. So I started just writing. I think it was one poem I wrote at the time, which was about grapes. It was something tr very trivial. But I realized that I liked the way the poem looked on the page. And yeah. so I started writing um, more. And then I realized that the more I wrote, it was just poetry and it was coming out. And I was like, ah, I could just put everything in poetry. And so what I did was just get a sheet of paper. I wrote all the topics that I always had in mind to write about. I just wrote them down. I just the topic, just, you know, topics and topics and topics. And yeah. then every day I would just look at each topic and write a verse or two about it. Um, and then I did that just randomly without waiting, without thinking about it. I just wrote that. Wrote, wrote. Um, and then before I knew I had, you know, 70, 80 uh, so, so-called poems. And I put them in a page and I was like, okay, this poem is coherent. This form a coherent whole because they relate to the travel experience, they relate to my contact with America, they relate to my teaching experience, they relate to my um, being a student. Yeah. And I thought, well, this is nice. I, I could make this a collection of poetry, but there was nobody offering to publish it or anything like that. So I was like, okay, um, let me just write it and see what happens. So I left it in one corner, and then one day I was on Facebook and I met this gentleman I'd met a couple of years earlier, who teaches at Oxford. Um, he wrote something that he, you know, he was releasing a book of his from his own small, small press of poetry. I yeah. was like, ah, okay. Um, let me just query him and see what he says about about this. And I said, okay, I would like to you to take a look at this collection I have. Uh, if you think it's good enough, uh, I would like to. I'm looking for a place to publish it, etc. I didn't even ask him directly. You know, do you want to publish my poem and stuff? But he took a while. It took like three weeks or four or so. So the next time he was going to talk to me, he said, um, so we are putting this on the timetable to be published in September or something. It, was, it caught me by surprise because I hadn't planned it. And oh, I wow. hadn't even put any, any major effort except just put the memory down. Yeah. Um, so I, I really started panicking again, like, oh, my God, what have I done? Now I'm going to put all this terrible work outside and everybody's going to see how horrible <laughs> right? I am. So I took all of it back in and then started looking at it more objectively as a, as a poetry, a coherent whole. And I started then putting the crafts in, in all of them that were just memories. Yeah. Now I made them more punchy, more poetic, something I could read out loud in a public place. Um, and that was when much of the work I did uh, on the work itself. Uh, and then I sent him, of course, after a couple of weeks, the new updates and saying, well, whatever it is you said you accepted the first time, thank you for doing that, but this is actually what I want to present. And he looked at it and he was like, okay, this is much better. And then we started working towards on the work together and editing and and put it together. So um, the, why did I use choose poetry? I didn't choose it. You just, it would just happen to be what the thing came out of. Uh, and yeah. I felt that, you know, when, when you want to write, every, whatever you write a praise for is a, uh, a work that makes itself effortless, uh, even if it's not, that lets you get everything you need to get out as, as fast as you can without being distracted. And this was it. It gave me the chance to be able to put everything I wanted to write down. Uh, and that worked out that way. Um, could have been anything else, but I enjoy, I like the fact that it's poetry. And then I, I think I finally, somewhere in the middle, became even more convinced that poetry was the uh, channel I would use for this because I, I, I realized many people who write about travel, and I had written about travel myself, I'd written for Next, I'd written for my blog, I'd all, done all this in nonfiction, that maybe for the, for the first time, uh, at least for me, I would be making poetry work in a different, um, a different, way that he had not worked before. Uh, travel writing, everybody went into travel writing, think of, you know, um, from Mark Twain to Tejikul to different people who wrote prose. And I said, okay, maybe it's nice to try something else. Um, and, you know, it makes it easy to judge it on its own merits, both as a new way of right of doing stuff and, and also uh, for whatever it is he's trying. Okay. Um, I think now would be a perfect time for you to read one or two poems from your book so that the audience yes. can just can just get a taste, a bit of taste of, yeah, Edward's will by heart. By heart. Um, thank you. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, I wrote it on thinking about the behavior of animals on, on campus. Um, animals have got this huge respect that I, I, I always found very interesting on campus where you couldn't touch them. Even if they hurt you, you had to either call authorities or do something. So I wrote this comparing the behavior of animals on the campus in the U.S. to Nigeria. It's titled Campus Deer. 
No one would believe that the African had not seen them alive this close ever until language brought him there. Certainly not the students who regaled him with third-hand tales he had heard and believed of the Maasai outrunning a leopard until it collapsed too tired to move. I'm not Maasai, he should have responded with a frown. Instead, he explained the difference between East and West, rural and urban, Ibadan and Rift Valley, wide open lands and urban zoos, village hunters and city dwellers. At Kuga village, the difference was never exactly clear, which tickled him. Brown friends on the lawn, the animals ate behind the tennis court on his way to class, and stared at him with little interest. Lagos Ibano Expressway on poles, hanging down the hunter's hands like a roadside flag that cousins knew an African when they saw one in the bush, singing a jala to the boom of Dan rifles and waiting cauldrons, pounded yam and fresh wine, ready to welcome hunter and game. It was disrespect, he thought, that venison could read, like students, the signs that said, call 911 if you are ever attacked by a deer. That's the point. Okay. So do you want to read another one? And then um, I can ask some of the questions in the comments. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Um, this is titled First Malaria. I wrote it, uh, obviously, after the first sickness I had while I was in the U.S., um, and one of the things you would, I would refer to this poem um, was something I found sometime also while I was in school, that if you were Nigerian or if you had lived in Nigeria since 1978, you couldn't give blood to the Red Cross. So I referenced oh. that here as well. Yes. Six weeks in, I crashed down in sweats and fever with symptoms all too familiar, except to the doctor and students to whom I could only have been dying in installments beyond American care. With me, a few doses of home calm the room, Fancida, Atesunet, Paracetamol, as Nigerian doctors prescribed. Not enough, though, to calm the red, cam red uh, the campus Red Cross, to whom being Nigerian was enough disqualification and would say no more. Often, I remember the joke about the students from somewhere speaking British English who answered drugs when asked at the border what he had in his luggage to declare. He did not make his next flight. At Kuga village, the mosquitoes bore West Nile virus and encephalitis and probed just as hungrily as the school insurance administrators who gave no refunds and no fox, except the cold comfort that it won't just be malaria that kills me here. Thank you. All By right. the way, Kuga village was where I stayed. That's what it's called. Uh, for some reason, they call it Kuga village because the school's mascot is Kuga. So, um, so the, the campus residence where grad students live. So okay. when you get Kuga village, it's not it's not the Kuga that we. It's we not know. the Kuga that Remy knows. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, exactly. so one of the questions we have here is: Do you know anyone from CAR, Central African Republic? Mm, do I know anyone from there? Um, no. Okay, because they because there's another country called Namibia, and it's the CAR of SADC. And there's a writer, I don't even know if we can call him a writer from that country, called Remy. And he's asking, what makes a good poem? Because the things he has been writing are not good and they've been rejected by everyone. So he wants to know how he can write hey, poetry. If it makes him feel better, Lolue rejected my poems too. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. his were not even good enough to submit. So he wants to know how he's <laughs> good enough for rejection. <laughs> I think I think um, a poem a poem is as good as you think it is. Um, I think um, I mean what I at some point I mean when, earlier in my years when I when I used to write in university and stuff I used to feel this huge imposter syndrome wondering you know is this poem good enough am I you know do I am I do I sound like these great people we admire and all yeah and but I've I've grown I've I've grown that um, I've gone to the stage where the poem is what I enjoy, what yeah. I find interesting, um, what I what I I mean when I'm done with the poem when when I'm when I think I'm done with it I know in my heart this is a poem I like I enjoy, it. I can read yeah. it myself. So when it gets to that stage when I'm satisfied with it I'm fine with it. It doesn't matter whether um, um, you know whether somebody thinks it's good or somebody thinks it's bad. Yeah. Uh, 
And again, being rejected, of course, is not always doesn't always mean the poem is bad either. Um, as you know, it's you know each edition of any publication has its own themes. It has its own editor and all of that. So, so your poem is good. That's why I, I think you should keep writing as long as you like it and you have somebody who can read it too and they enjoy it. Uh, please, please don't encourage him. That's how we are <laughs> having some of these people. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's any meaningful question here, but all these people are just trolls. Mola, <laughs> send in a question. Um, let me scroll back. Um, all poems. Yes. All poems matter, I think poems so. Matter. Well, <laughs> now you've made these people troll all the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be fair, I did not read the poetry for the issue. That was the poetry. Don't worry, you're, you're, you're safe. You're safe. You're still welcome to my house. So, <laughs> so Remy, please leave me alone. Um, honestly, these people are just trolling, but they're not asking any any meaningful questions. So, I think I'm just. I think how old was I? Somebody just asked me a question. Uh, yeah, how old was how I when old, I started writing? How old were you that when you started writing? And that I'll guy, that add, guy is asking. I'll just add to it before you answer it. Um, can you tell us, you know, what your writing journey has been and what you kind of anticipated it to be and what it has turned out to be? Um, so, like I said, I mean, I, I, I didn't grow up trying to be a writer, actually. When I think about it, I, was, I grew up trying to run away from being a writer because my father was a writer. and I, But he wrote in Yoruba, so some, in some way, I, I, I think I did run away from it a little bit, at least for a while. Um, so I wasn't aspiring to be a, a writer or anything. Um, but I remember in secondary school, the first uh, creative work I ever wrote was in secondary school. It was 1996. Um, it was a competition about Nigeria. I was supposed to write this patriotic poem about Nigeria. And I wrote, that was the first time I, I, I discovered the sonnet a couple of weeks before, and I wanted to try it out. So I wrote something that was like a sonnet, I think, um, praising Nigeria for how great it was and all that. It was a horrible poem. Um, but I thought I was going to win something, and I submitted for a competition. Um, of course, I did not win. I think I, I may still have a copy of it somewhere. Uh, so that was the first time I ever wrote. Um, and then I, in the intervening years between my my WIAC and my that's the final exam in secondary school at the university, I wrote a, a couple of work. And then in the university, um, we had this uh, press board where you could put your work. So I put some of my work there. Um, at the beginning, I thought, well, this was nice, you know, let me share it with the world. And then I started meeting people who actually wrote good poetry and who saw and said, you know, what the hell is this? What are you doing? What are you doing? And that, that kind of reinforcement, the uh, collectives we had, the poetry competitions we, uh, we had in campus, we had this, uh, what we call the Ibadan Poetry Club, where you met, you know, in the evenings and you shared your work and you have conversations about it. That and the schools and the people around you that you saw, you saw New York Shindari around, you saw, you know, we started reading people who had been successful. And then I think that was when I started paying attention to uh, my craft, you know, we tried to copy and become like other people. Um, but of course, my voice, I didn't find my voice really um, until later in the university. And then when I left, and then when I started, you know, trying to write exactly how I wanted to. So 1996, I was, uh, I was 15. Okay. That helps. Yeah. All right. Um, there's a question here from Hannibal, not Lecter. He's asking, <laughs> um, you use a very expository style in your work. Have you worked with forms like Sestinas or tanker, Tankers, I think, or do you eschew using them? Oh, my God. I have no idea what these are. Sestinas, Tankers, never heard those before. They sound like uh, incantations. I've never heard them before. But um, I, I, I enjoyed writing prose. Um, like I said, you know, I'd written a lot of travel work. When I was in the U.S., I sent a couple to Next. I think um, Molara Wood, uh, our great editor, was uh, working at Next at the time, and she helped edit and publish a couple of them. Um, so I, I'm very interested in nonfiction and the power of stories, um, you know, to describe, to document and all of that. So I have done a lot of work in that regard. So I'm, I'm just extremely happy that poetry exists as well as a medium to help tell the same, uh, stories. All if right. You've, you've, you've mentioned Molara and she's here. She's asking, 
how is the showing cup book going because um we there's a record of mmf um um yeah so of course is, not publishing yes yeah you said, um, you said it for the record i didn't say it because i still need to apply for it so you <laughs> said it <laughs> yes um it's going well i mean it depends on what day it is right the the um Stipulation was that I wrote 10,000 words every month, which I did um, all through last year. But having the 10,000 words is not the same thing as writing the work you want and having you know what you want to write. If it's just left to a marathon of writing 10,000 words every month and you have 120,000 words and you publish it, um, then the book will be out already. But that's not satisfactory to me because what yeah. I want to write, I still haven't, I still haven't got there. Um, so I, I'm still continuing to do the work, um, which sometimes includes having more interviews and conversations and tweaking the work and sometimes realizing what well, this direction I wanted to go in a different way. Um, the book has taken so many forms. From the beginning, it was going to be just um, Shrinka uh, as a hunter and the influence of uh, um, the, the, um, the, the depletion of our natural habitat um, comparing that to the, the role Shrink has played over the years and all of that. Um, and then it included, you know, it's an autobiography, so it, the other part of his life that I thought it would be interesting to explore. And then um, as a non-fiction work, I also started to involve myself in it as, you know, my idea, my journey of actually discovering how much Shrink exists, so how much exists that we don't yet know. Um, in doing that, you know, that has taken me to you know, different ways of writing and rewriting the work. The, the professor, the writer himself, um, having been exposed to people trying to probe and find, you know, his life um, has been very, very difficult. And he said that from the very beginning, by the way, so it's not his fault. That, you know, I wish you luck. Uh, people have tried, you know, to do whatever you want to do. So it's not like, I'm, you know, I'm going to sit him down and be asking him questions about his life. He doesn't have yeah. that time. So it's my yeah. role to look and to, and, to, and to dig and to find all the things I need to find and make it my work. Uh, not just the work he's trying to put, put on the wall. Um, and being in London has really helped, being in the British Library and discovering a lot of more material that I would not have found um, had I just remained in Nigeria, which is ironic because I believe MMF also, you know, was trying to find writers who were based in Nigeria. Um, yeah. to do the work. But being in London actually helped because there's a lot of material that I, I, I was able to find and operate into the work. So I'm enjoying the process. I'm looking forward to the complete work. Um, um, if that answers the question, it's it's going as as uh, as good as I want it to be. <laughs> okay, um, there's a question here from Degwa, and he is asking basically if you are stuck in London in the middle of winter, and yeah. your heating went off, which Nigerian books will you set on fire to keep yourself warm? Ooh, that <laughs> is a good one. You're trying to get me into trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> There is a book that got me really, there's a book that still gets me really frustrated. I'm not going to burn it because the writer is my friend. Okay, but you really... keep yourself warm, you know? It's winter. Mm. Yeah. Trying to keep myself warm. Uh, 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 uh... <laughs> no. Uh, um... This is a safe place. Does, does it have to be a Nigerian, does it have to be a Nigerian book? Yeah, this is specifically a question about Ni a Nigerian book. Let me see. Probably hmm. something not edited by Molara because she's a good editor. So. <laughs> no, <laughs> not her. Not her. I, I, I'm not going to set any Nigerian book on fire. Sorry. Okay. So I, just I would rather freeze. Today. I would okay. freeze to that. Okay. We see where your loyalties lie. <laughs> um, <laughs> Remy, Remy is asking. Okay. I, I need to ignore Remy's questions because there's just so many questions from him. Um, Anthony is asking, how long did it take you to find your agent? And I'll just tie it in with an earlier question um, asking about your writing process and if it has changed in any way. Um, I haven't found an agent. Okay. If he was asking about the publishing, the, the poetry book, I didn't need an agent. I, I approached the publisher myself and said yes, and that was it. Um, for the for the non-fiction book, I have someone I'm talking to who says when I'm done, let me let me know. And MMF also helps connect you to um, editors and maybe agents as well. So I, I look forward to that. That that shouldn't be an issue. Um, the process of writing. What's the question about that? Sorry, 
I think I may have missed it. No, just your, basically your creative process, your writing process, and if it has changed over the years, for example, if you um, got the MMF. Um, the MMF, yes, um, pushed me to meet deadlines every month. I mean, that's, yeah. that's one of the good things about it. You had to meet the deadlines, otherwise you'll find your, your money is not going to come. So I had to, you know, get to get on my game. The, the downside to that, like I said, is if you're writing nonfiction, you have to research. Sometimes your pace of writing doesn't always go with the pace of inspiration you get. Um, that's for the work. For my, for my poetry, um, everything I wrote it happened in like one, one week or two. The ideas that were always there, I just had the time that I didn't have before, so I put everything down. And the editing yeah. followed later. Nowadays, when I write, I write late in the night when everybody's sleeping or early in the morning when I wake up. Okay. Um, there's a question here. I think it has been asked more than once. Um, who yes. are some yes. of your influences, your poetry influences, some of the poets you admire on that kind yes. of thing? Uh, every time I ask this question, I take them back to Yoruba poetry, which is where my first intimation with poetry came. All the first poets I listened to were Yoruba poets, and they recorded their work, uh, and they chanted them and performed them live and sometimes on the record plates. So from Tsubos Maladapo to Lanewa Jadipo to Alabiu um, Kundipo to... Um, even the you know co comedians Baba Salah, Moses Adejumo, um, um, a number of other you know Ogundari and the rest of them. Those were the first people. I, you know, even before I even was conscious of anything, there were people my father played in the house. He had this huge loudspeaker and you know record player in the corner of the house, and you know, wake up in the morning to you know sounds of uh, music playing in the house. And sometimes they they this people come around because he produced some of them as well. Um, so that was the first thing I, I, I heard. And then later in, in, in life, um, actually even before I started writing, he handed me this, uh, my first copy of the collected works of Shakespeare, um, which I read, um, I mean, not all of it, but at least some of the poet, poetry there I read uh, at the time I was like 13 or 14. So many of the first poems I wrote were rhyming, you know, with traditional forms and all of that. Uh, so that yeah. comes from Shakespeare and this generation of, of writers. Uh, later, I was showing Kaya, Clark, and all the uh, other other ones. So mm -hmm. most of my influences have come from those traditional um, um, uh, poets and and forms. All right, I'm glad you brought that up because you know your work with the Yoruba language and your work in linguistics has been very important. So can you just tell us more about more about it and you know what made you take an interest in the language? What made you take an interest in the effort that you've put towards your Yoruba as a language? Yes. Um, when I was growing up, uh, like I said, you know, my father was a record producer and, and broadcaster. Um, in the house, he spoke Yoruba to us. My mother spoke Yoruba to us. When we went to school, we spoke in English. My school was a private school. They penalized you for speaking Yoruba at all. So there was always a tension that was there that was unacknowledged, that whenever you stepped out of the school premises, you could speak Yoruba, especially especially when you're made to know around to make fun of you. Um, but you had to speak only English in school. But when you got home, it was your Yoruba, and you were able to switch and get along with it. But there was a day my father came to school, and the students got up and said, uh, good morning, sir. And he looked so lost. The guy, the guy went to University of Lagos, so at least he had some education. Um, he, he looked so lost and pretended as if he didn't understand anything they were saying, and said, Emil, bo, Emil. And the students who of course understood what he was saying to mean that he didn't understand what they were saying, yeah. giggled to themselves and then they said, Oh, uh, good Eka uh, Rosa. They all repeated, you know, Eka Rosa, good morning, you're in Europe. And they said, Hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then he went to the teacher and did whatever he came to do. But I was so embarrassed. For the very first time, my father had broken the glass ceiling between the home and the, the, the type of, uh, um, you know, conversation, the kind type of upbringing, the type of language uh, uh, environment we had at home, and the one we had in the school. So my world just crashed right there because I assumed that all my, my fellow um, colleagues were going to laugh at me and make fun of yeah. my father who didn't speak uh, English and all of that. Um, so I, I remember being very conscious of it. But that was the, I mean, I don't know what happened afterwards. I went home, I got home, all of that. But I was upset with him. I remember 
every time I think back to my childhood, that was the most memorable time of my high school, uh, my primary school. I was probably eight years old then, but the memory has remained. And it was when I became an adult that I started questioning why, at the time, I felt embarrassed that my father had come to class and spoken Yoruba, or why I thought that my mates were going to be upset about it. Of course, growing up also, I realized you know, there were many of my mates who, when they left school and went home, also spoke English at home, didn't yeah. speak any of their own language. Um, but the environment I had at home allowed me to acquire both languages with equal competence. Um, we went to a Yoruba church. Um, of course, eventually they started doing trans um, interpretation. You know, the pastor would speak Yoruba and somebody else would speak English. We heard um, audio records in Yoruba uh, most of the time. There were books at home. Like I said, he had the Shakespeare book. He had Reader's Digest. He had Drum Magazine. He also had Atoka. He had uh, Prime People, Fun Times. He had Ariake. We had just different books from in different, those two languages, you know, all of that. So there was no, at home, there was no conflict at all. Everything was just like, you know, those languages are equally valid and equally important. So I, I kind of grew up being confident in myself, uh, yeah. being able to understand this. So I think was when I finished, so my undergrad was in linguistics, my grad school was in uh, linguistics and teaching English as a second language. It was towards the end of my master's when um, Twitter was translating the platform to some languages. They, they launched this Twitter translation platform. Yeah. That was the first time I I was I started paying, you know, conscious attention to the role of the language in technology. I had thought about it, you know, as a as an abstract thing that oh well some people are not speaking language to children, the language is this, okay, those were those are existed, those are conversations that always existed. Um but when Twitter announced that, uh, they were announced uh, translating it into they mentioned a couple of languages, but none of them was an African language. Yeah. I started paying more attention to it, and I, I realized then that oh, we could pressure Twitter to actually add Yoruba to the languages they were translating into. So we said we're going to have a tweet Yoruba day and have everyone tweet in the language, in Yoruba specifically, and then hashtag tweet Yoruba and copy the Twitter translation handle. And I wrote a blog post about it explaining what we were doing and all of that. And so everybody did that. You know, every day, even people who didn't know why we were doing it, just so everybody was writing in Yoruba, so everybody did. So there was a lot of European content on it on Twitter that day. And they, they, they literally reached out to me that day and said, you know, we're going to include Yoruba in the list of languages that we want to translate to. But they didn't do it that year. We did it again the next year, did it again. In 2014, they finally opened the translation platform and we did the translation and all that. So I think since then, or around that time, I've been paying attention to how technology has excluded African languages, um, specifically mine and a number of other African languages that I started thinking of what I could do. I'd acquired the skills in computer um, technology. I was a linguist. And I knew that I, my upbringing as a full bilingual Yoruba English speaker put me in a, in a, in a crucial space. Because yeah. again, one of the things I realized I mean, on Twitter, Facebook, social media, everybody was content to complain about what was wrong. Oh, yeah. why is this thing this way? And everybody retweeted and then everybody forgets about it and, and it's gone. One day I decided I'm, I'm going to stop complaining about things I change. If I could do something about it, I won't complain about it, I'll just do it. Yeah. And so that was where all the ideas started coming. And I realized that there were other people who were also hungry for that kind of space. And many of them volunteered for our work. And um, so that's, that's where we got to where we are. All right. Um, so obviously you've challenged us. And now when are you pressuring Duolingo to add Yoruba to it so that the rest of us can learn, can learn Yoruba? Well, Duolingo is a is a is a commercial enterprise. Um, I assume that if people more people ask for it, they will find the, the translate the linguists and teachers to help put the content there. Um, okay. If they come to me, I'll take it as a job. I mean, I want the dollars. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so one of the things that have been coming up while you were talking about Yoruba is, you know, do you write in Yoruba? Have you? written anything in Yoruba or do you plan to write your work in Yoruba? So, you know, there's obviously yes. the, the old argument between Gugi wanting to write in Kikuyu and Achebe saying, you know what, we can still write in English, but make it our own. So which, which, school, which school do you belong to? Um, I agree very well that Yoruba writing needs to um, happen. It needs to exist. Uh, yeah. I have done some work in Yoruba um, 
I'm not proud of all the poems I've written in Yoruba, to be honest, because my competence as a poet in Yoruba is, is you know, it leaves, <laughs> it leaves a lot to be desired. But I yeah. am trying. Uh, yeah. What I've been doing, however, is uh, translating. So many times you go online, you search for translation, grants for translation. You will find everybody offering you money to translate work from uh, a language into English or into French, yeah. into German, etc. You will ra rarely find any um, grants giving you money to translate work from English into an African language. Yeah. So uh, I think that's a very big space. Um, as a writer, I see how important that is. In the 60s and the 50s, there were a lot of books published in Yoruba that had great um, acceptance from Fagwa to Odunjo to Faliti and the rest of them. Um, but since the Africans took over publishing, we seem to have let that go, which is very sad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Every time you ask people, they say, well, the market is not there. Well, the market was there then. So somebody, something has to happen. It's a cycle. It was broken at some point. Somebody has to start. Even if you make a loss at the beginning, you have to then create the market and more people will get in and then it goes on. Um, but I believe that with translation, we can bridge the gap. Yeah. Um, so I, I, in last year, I translated a short story by Chimamanda Adichie. And okay. I'm starting with contemporary writers because I believe, um, because many people are already familiar with them and they know their yeah. work. I translated uh, this short story she wrote called The Shivering, uh, which was published, an excerpt was published in Arcade Review and the full version was published in Michigan uh, University um, Press. Um, and I'm, I, I, I finished another one last month, uh, which is a short story by Ukamaka Olisakwe. Yeah. So I believe that more contemporary work by Nigerian writers in English can be translated into local languages. More people might become more familiar with them rather than just a new work that's come from out of nowhere. You know, you know that it's a work you know. You know somebody who does it. And I'm also yeah. interested in this idea of, you know, translating work from writers who did, don't even speak Yoruba as a first language, as a yeah. way of kind of bridging the gap between um, the ideas that we're trying to generate uh, in Nigeria, you know, from one ethnic group to another to form, you know, a kind of uh, a highly fermented, you know, uh, 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 beautiful literary environment for conversation to happen. Um, so so that, that's one of the things I'm doing. And I think it's one of the important ways of getting... Um, conversation happening. What I, the last thing I was going to mention is that as a linguist, it's also important for me because uh, one of the reasons why the tools of technology don't favor African languages is because there's not enough um, African language content on the internet. Yeah. So until the BBC came in, in uh, 2016 or thereabouts with uh, Yoruba and Pidgin language services and Igbo, there were really a place where you could find um, full a content in those languages that are fully well written with, with trans uh, diacritics and all of that. Um, and so when Google wants to create a, a voice assistant or translation engine, they had to pay a lot of money to generate their own user, uh, their own content, their own yeah. data in those languages. But if we put a lot of writing in the language already on the internet, um, we make it easier for tools of technology to be created in those languages. So if you go online and you can find a short story in, in, by Chibamanda in Yoruba, another one by Ukamaka, another one by Molara Wood and all these people. And people write on the internet in Yoruba and people use Yoruba very well, except for Igbo, Hausa, you know, Kikuyu and the rest. Then we make the internet more democratized. And when yeah. people come and they want to create tools for those languages, they have a lot of material to use as a basis for that work. Okay, so obviously you are a linguist, so I can ask you this question. If you, yes. could create, if you could create one language for the African continent to speak as a lingua franca or, you know, just another common language added to what they already speak, which language would you borrow from the most? Yoruba, of course. What else? <laughs> Are you that's, very, that? that's an easy question. How will you ask me that? This is a very easy question. <laughs> Next. <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> There's a question here from Frankie. Do you do you think English is an African language? Um, I have written about that argument, that particular argument. Um, obviously, it's become an African language for many people. It's what some people speak as a first language. And there's nothing you can do to change that, whether we argue against it or not. My problem with, um, with it um, is that people... Um, who speak the language as a first language in other places 
have not accepted us as native speakers of the language. There are people in Nigeria who don't speak any other language from birth. They've spoken English all their lives. But when they want to go to university, they get to write test of English as a foreign language, um, which either tells us that English is a foreign language to, to them, you know, from us, or that, you know, um, you know we're not, we not seen as a native speaker of the language. So I think there's a problem there. But the, as, whether it's a, a language in Africa, of course it is. Um, I don't think it should supersede all the other languages that exist. I believe yeah. that as many other languages that exist on the continent should thrive, should be used and usable in education, in technology, in um, every other domain as, as much as English is. I don't like the fact that many African, lang uh, Af African countries have used English to kind of stifle their own languages, usually under the excuse of it brings unity or it brings, you know, um, understanding and all that uh, nonsense. I don't believe it, of course. Uh, because if, if English was to bring unity, we wouldn't have had a civil war in Nigeria. Ojuku spoke British English. He schooled in Oxford. Go on, um, you know, spoke British English as well. Um, it's not the language that is a problem. It's not the English language that is bringing unity, you know, the ideas you have. You can all speak different languages. South Africa has 11 official languages, you know. Um, you can still do that and make the languages thrive. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I definitely wasn't going to end this session without asking you, poetry or cocaine? Why are you asking people this question? <laughs> <laughs> because it has been the festival question from season one. I, I don't know what out. cocaine feels like. I don't know. I've never, no, I've never but seen it. that's why we're asking you. Okay. Um... And it's not limited to just taking it. It's about selling it. It's about distribute. It's just... It's as open as you Tell me, tell me, tell me about this, your business. Tell me, talk, talk to me. <laughs> I won't well, tell anybody. <laughs> see me on the side, but for now you have to choose. It's, it's, it's uh, poetry. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. you have to know it's a very important question to the festival. Yeah, I see. I see you asking everyone. I've been wondering what <laughs> um, this is. This is idea. Let, let me see if there's any other question. Um, what language do you dream in? I dream... Um, I, we see, this is a very good question because I, I, when I think about it, I, I realize there's no language in my dream. There is no language. There are just images and and moving things and oh, you don't and talk colors. Like dreams? No. And no, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't talk. I don't talk okay, so Remy is obviously <laughs> abnormal. Then um, there was another question here. Let me see. Um, I was going to read uh, one of my works in progress. If you're interested. Yeah, actually, that would be a great idea because I can't seem to find um, any other questions um, in the in the reply. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Mrs. says she has a question. Does she have a question? Maybe you missed no. this. Um, BC, what was your question? I've asked BC a question. I think. Let me see. Ah, they want to read. Okay, don't worry about it. So, okay. um, I printed some of these poems. So, I, since I went to London, I've been working on a new collection. At the beginning, I thought it was going to be just my observation on London um, and my experience there and all that. Of course, that has been cut short because of COVID. So, it's taking a number of turns as well. These are just a, some of the poems I'm working on. Some of them will make it and some will not. This one I wrote yesterday, even though the idea has been with for a long time, I uh, actually started the, 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 the title itself. I conceived it while I was in the uh, self isolation when I arrived back in Nigeria in March. The title okay. is No Wine in My Quarantine. So, um, the subtitle to Nigerian English and Viral Drought. You will see why. Um, in in uh, Nigerian English, we, we, we call it quarantine. Of course, in, in British English, they call it uh, quarantine. So yeah. this is my attempt to rhyme quarantine with as many English words sound like wine rather than tea. Okay. So here it goes. Chords E and G, half mute fumblings through the night that is long and dry jest, and a fridge that is full on which a leg rests. There's hot food and plenty on which to dine, but there is no wine in my quarantine. Zoom, they say. And other web lenses bring the world near, stop to their looms, with bubbling tones, house party rooms, and emails that begin with, I hope you're fine, 
Yet, there is no wine in my quarantine. I see the bridge out of my window, Nollywood, iconography. I stride the lagoon under the cover of dark, with boats awaiting right of lovers, eager to row through the dark herb of brine. And still, no wine for my quarantine. London is gone now, with the wry smiles, faces behind the veil of history's guilt and mood, drying up with the city's torso now stark nude. I'm here alone in the presence to better times, pretense to better times, but still no wine in my quarantine. My sister visited last night, and in the distance wove our fears into jokes we shared as refrain and hugs that could never be, lest we bring more pain to the heart of those for whom we'd rather pine. Who bring no wine, though, to my quarantine? Distance, the taste of memories, the wine shop lay across the street, far from the craving's hands. Science, which reminds to stave in stoic silence. Smile at the screen with the love that waits for its time. When wine makes it here into my quiet time. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, BC, I, I'm not ignoring your question. Okay, so BC was asking, do you listen to Juju music? Um, yes, I do. I like uh, okay. King Sonia Ade. King Sonia Ade is very good. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that's the only pending question. Um, so thank <laughs> you so much for, for this collage. It has been so wonderful. I think we've learned so much about languages and poetry and nonfiction. So thank you so much for this. Um, thank you. All right. So I'm just going to end the session now. Thank you very much. How are you doing? What have you been? What have been up to? I'll tell you this on the side when I've ended this, so that it doesn't cut us off. All right. All right. Have a nice evening. All right.